Have you ever said, woe is me? Have you ever said, oh my God? Have you ever said, OMG? How did I find myself in this predicament? <laughs> Today's message, my mission, is to help you understand that seeking the face of Jesus, seeing his face indeed, takes you from your woe to the go. We want to go from woe is me to hearing God say go. Between, sandwiched between the two, Isaiah will show us this, Elijah will show us this, is hearing a very specific word, a pertinent word from the Lord. I want to warn you, we can come to church every Sunday and not hear God. We can worship God with the best of our ability and still not hear God. Oh, I didn't say that the worship music wasn't anointed. I didn't say that the speaker was not anointed and didn't have a pertinent word from God. But we can sit in these, I was about to say pews. We can sit in these comfortable, beautiful chairs and not hear from God. Go home after hearing this wonderful scripture and wonderful word and being in this wonderful experience of the worship and all of that and wonder why we're still saying, woe is me, OMG, how did I get here? Why am I not released to go? How come I'm stuck in this place? But I'm going to tell you if that's you, if you're here tonight, today, and you've experienced the woe is me, I've got some good news for you. Jesus Christ specializes in freeing people. It's what he wants to do. He said that I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He said the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But don't get it twisted, folks. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm the life giver. I'm the freer. I'm the one who tells demons where to get off because I'm Jesus, and that's how I roll. If you are a child of the king, then it is a part of your meat, your privilege to be free. If you are a child of the king, it is a part of your destiny, your lot to be free, not to be bound. So let me tell you something. I know a lot of us give in to the stuff that's going on around us. Well, it's just going to be this way. I'm telling you right now, I don't want to serve notice on you and the devil, that if whatever you're going through is keeping you from hearing God's voice and is keeping you from spreading the gospel and doing what God has called you to do, I'm telling you, that thing is born of Satan and God wants it to go. Uh-huh. Do I need to say it again so I can get at least two claps? Okay, three, four, how about 10? Or how about you just say amen? amen? Would you turn quickly to Isaiah, the sixth chapter, please? Tell your neighbor, I'm going from woe. Okay, same thing happened downstairs. It's amazing. They didn't, they didn't hear me, you know. How many of you drive, um, you within like a half hour of here, from here? Is it a half hour? You got here, you get here quickly, you know? It took me an hour and 10 minutes to get here. I'm awake, okay? Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor? That's right, good, good, good. Say neighbor, I'm going from woe to go. Amen. All right. Isaiah 6, uh, 6 chapter verse 1. In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated and high on a lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. 
strange characters. And one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices. Someone say their voices. Yeah. And the temple was filled with smoke. First of all, let me give you an idea of the scene. Isaiah is seeing a vision of being in the temple and he's seeing the Lord high and lifted up on his throne as he should be. And then around the throne are these six winged creatures. The Bible calls them seraphims, comes from the Greek word or the Hebrew word flames. So these are six winged angels. You'll find out later they have hands and arms, okay? And they're on fire, and they're calling one to another, not to the one on the throne, but about the one on the throne. They're calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. They are testifying. How many people know how to testify? How many people have seen people testify? You see, your testimony is always vertical because it, all sh it should always glorify God. But it is also speaking to one another. You see, our worship songs should always be vertical. But sometimes in our worship songs, we talk to one another about the one who sits on the throne. Now, these angels are testifying of the holiness. Now, so far, the only ones that are speaking are the angels. Somebody says there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And in this temple, because of their voices, the place is uh, uh, vibrating. You know, Peter, I thought about bringing you a recording of something with real deep bass sounds in it that would rattle this building, but then I thought better of it. But I want you guys to think about this for a moment, that you're Isaiah, and you're seeing this vision, okay? You're seeing the Lord high and lifted up. He's saying nothing. He's not speaking yet. And the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They're testifying back and forth to one another about the one who's sitting on the throne. The place is rattling, shake. Rattle and roll, right? The place is rattling. The vibration is deep. The bass, back in the days of raps, and we, when rap first started, you know, we used to have this, this, um, this, this tool called an 808. That, you, anybody ever hear of an 808? The bass sounds that came out of the 808 was off the chain. You know what I mean? You see, y'all know. If you've, ever been, if you've ever been in the hood and you've seen a cat rolling, and his windows are down, and you hear boom, gong, boom, gong. You can't even hear the lyrics. All you hear is boom, gong, boom. That's called the 808. The bass sound was off the chain. His, his car is rattling and everything, but he's feeling it. That's what Isaiah was experiencing. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect, man. That was perfect. I hope that's on the video. Holy cow. That was perfect. But it was a lot deeper than that. That was more like a trumpet. Can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so Isaiah is experiencing this 808, and he's frightened. Let's look at the next verse. Then I said, woe is me. Uh-oh. For I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from off the altar. He touched my mouth and with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. I want to bring something to your attention. So far, the only two people that have spoken in this text are the angels and Isaiah. But Isaiah's eyes are fixed on who? The one who sits on the throne. Something very interesting happens then. He says, woe is me. Now, 
In the first five chapters of Isaiah, I read no less than seven scriptures that started out with a woe. So I want to give you Isaiah's perspective of what a woe is. Isaiah is saying all through the book of Isaiah to this point that woe is that person who does thus and so. Woe is the man that does thus and so. Woe is the individual. Woe is the nation. Woe is it. He's speaking externally about everybody else. But now he comes in contact with the presence of the living God. He hears the angels rattle in the place with the thunderous voices, with their thunderous voices. And he is afraid and he understands that he is unfit. He is unfit in this environment. What environment? Well, that the Lord is holy. He is in a holy place and he sees himself for what he is. That is a man of unclean lips. and dwelling among a people that are unclean. He saw things clearly. It wasn't just them out there. We have found the enemy, and the enemy is us. But so far, the only voices you hear in this text are the angels and Isaiah. Let's see what happens when the one who sits on the throne speaks. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who shall I send and who will go for us? You guys have heard me say many times, God never asks questions to gain information. See, God knows everything. So God would never ask a question to gain information as if you have some information to share with him that he doesn't know. The reason God asks questions is to provoke thought, to make you think. And so God asks him a question. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah now speaks again. And he says, here am I. Send me. Wait a minute. Was this the same guy that just a minute ago said, woe is me, because I'm unfit, and I dwell among a people that are unfit? Now he's saying, yeah, I'll go, pick me, send me, I'll go? What was the difference? The difference was seeing the face of God. It was hearing the voice of Jesus. See, Mary found that out in Luke 10. Jesus was coming through the city. And he was invited to the house of Mary and Martha to have some food, to have some grub. The text doesn't say that, though. The text says he was invited to their house. Most of us assume that he's coming to the house to eat. You invite somebody. Let me tell you something. You invite me to your house? You, get, feed me, please. I don't care if it's a biscuit or give me something to drink. So we have to imagine, we have to assume that, yeah, Jesus is being invited. He's coming to get something to eat. Very strange, this text, because it says Martha then went to the kitchen and started working, preparing. That's what you would do, right, Sandy? Or you, Joe? Which one, whoever one cooks. and You would do that, right? If, we were, if Mercer and I were coming to your house, you'd... I know Carolyn and John would, because we've been to their house, and we eat good when we go to their house, right? So... So, so Jesus is coming to the house. Martha's in the kitchen. She's burning her butt off. She's in there grinding at the pot, doing what she needs to do. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha gets upset. She says, Jesus, don't you care that I'm working hard and I'm slavering, I'm doing all this labor, I'm working real hard up in here? Tell that heifer, you know, my sister Mary to, what, was that a bad word? Tell that chick, oh, I was going to say something else. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, tell Mary to get up off her tail and come help me. And Jesus says something very interesting to her. Martha, Martha, you worry about a lot of things. But Mary 
has decided to take the good part that shall not be taken away from her. That's what's important. Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. We must choose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Here's the thing. No matter how much worship goes on, the angels were worshiping. No matter how much noise is going on in the house because of the worship, that does not change our lives until we see Jesus and sit at his feet. I don't care how much, how great the worship was this morning, and it was the bomb. I don't care how good this message is, I hope it's the bomb. You will never go from your woe to the go unless you hear God speak to you. Unless your face is beholding the face of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. So here is Isaiah in that temple, experiencing the worship, seeing the one who sits on the throne, hearing all of this, feeling this experience that's going on there in the temple. And he looks at himself and he says, my God, I'm unfit. I can't do anything about my situation. I'm sinful. I'm not ready to go. I'm not the one. How many of you have said that to yourselves? I'm not the one. God, you can't send me because I'm not ready yet. I got a problem with anger. I got a problem with stealing. I got a problem with talking too much. I got a problem with lying. I got a problem with lust. I got a problem with fear. Lord, I can't go. And I'm stuck here. I can't do anything that you've called me to do. I'm stuck here. But let me tell you something. Let me give you some good news. If you look in the face of Jesus, if you sit at his feet, he will tell you something that will free you right then and there. Don't come to church to get this per se. You need to hear from Jesus. If you come to church, go to hear from Jesus. Go to tell somebody that God loves them. Go to fellowship. But you got to hear from Jesus. Would you turn to 1 Kings 19? I want to see what Elijah's story is. We're just making some observations, observations here and we're applying them as we go, if that's okay. Elijah's woe was fear and confusion. Let's take a look at this and see if you agree. And Ahab, the punk husband of Jezebel, told Jezebel, the one who was really wearing the pants, everything that Elijah had done and, he had, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to, to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Let me give you some background here. So Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel as to whose God is real. If Jehovah God is real, then he'll answer by fire. If the gods of Baal are real, then he'll answer by fire. And Elijah said, be my guest, boys. You guys go first. And so the prophets of Baal started crying out to their God. I believe they cried all day from, from, the, from the afternoon to the evening. They're cutting themselves. And Elijah's just sitting there on the side just kind of saying, listen, maybe you need to yell a little louder. Maybe your God doesn't hear you. You know what I mean? Maybe he's gone away on a journey. You know what I mean? Just, just yell a little louder because, you know, maybe he doesn't hear you. If he was God, he'd be able to hear a whisper. But, you know, but, but, but maybe he doesn't hear you. You know, so keep yelling, keep screaming. And they were cutting themselves and slicing themselves and bleeding all over the place. Lo and behold, their God does not answer. And then Elijah, in the midst of all of those prophets, stands there, hands lifted up towards heaven. He says, Jehovah God, answer by fire. 
And not only did God answer by fire, but he burned up the entire altar, everything. And then Elijah took his sword and killed every one of those prophets. My question for Jeze, Jezebel, you said by this time tomorrow, by the gods, you're going to kill Elijah. Do you mean the gods that didn't prove themselves? You mean that God? That God that was proven to be a hoax? That God? By this time tomorrow, you're going to kill me by those gods? Now, if I were Elijah, I wouldn't have been afraid. Not so fast, Larry. Verse 3. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he had come to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. You stay here. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't want you to be killed. I, I, you know, I, I can't deal with this. How is it that a prophet who was challenged the day before by these prophets of Baal, he won the challenge, God answered by fire. He killed every single one of those prophets, but now he's afraid. Let me tell you why. Remember this, never forget this. You, I, we are always most vulnerable after the victory. We tend to relax. Marissa and I are going to Africa in a few weeks. Thank you, Jesus. I expect for the Spirit of God to use my wife, to use me, to use those folks with us. And I expect for there to be a powerful time of uh, visitation from the Holy Spirit. I expect that. I'm praying for that. I'm expecting that. I am believing that. We would be foolish then to be on the plane on our way back, relaxing, and saying, God has used us. We've done a great job. Because how many people know that Satan never leaves his, his post? Three of you. How many of you know? Oh, maybe you don't know. Satan never leaves his post. He never stops badgering and getting at us. And he understands human nature. He understands that when we've got the victory, right after the victory comes the test. And that is why most times Jesus, after he healed a ton of people, where did he go? To the mountain to, consume with his to, to, to consult with his father. Because he understood the tendency to relax. So here's Elijah. After having this incredible victory, he's now scared of one woman. Maybe it was her reputation. Maybe it was that she was a mean, vindictive, bloodthirsty queen, evil. Verse 4. But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. Someone say the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that, it might, that he might die. And he said, I have had enough. Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him. The angel told him, get up and eat. And then he looked, and there was, at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. What journey? Well, we're about to find out in a moment. Verse 8. So he got up, ate, and drank. Then on the strength of that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights. Someone say 40 days and 40 nights. How many days did he walk? How many nights did he walk? In the scriptures, the word, or the word, the number 40 has great significance. 40 is a time of testing. We know that the Israelites stayed 40 years in the wilderness. It was a time in which God was testing them. We know that Jesus fasted for how many days and nights? Yeah, in the wilderness. By doing so, he overcame what the Jews 
failed to do in 40 years. Jesus in 40 days overcame it in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil. 40 is a time of testing. I believe that Elijah was going through a test from God and God was about to bring it to fruition. If you're wondering why it's taking you so long to get off the ground, if you're wondering why your woe is lasting for a very long time, I want you to know that you're going through a period of testing. But God means this test. He means for you to succeed and pass this test. He means for you to go through what you're going through so you will get to the other side. I say that to encourage you. I want you to know that your delay does not mean God's denial. For in your delay, God has sent angels to feed you. How many people have been fed by God? Yeah, yeah, when, when there was too much month at the end of the money, God made provision. Did he not? He did he not make provision. In those times when you didn't know which way you were going, God led you here and sent you over there. Maybe God sent you to this church and that just by coming here saved your life. He has connected this church to your destiny. Somebody say amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God does that along the way. But it doesn't mean that the journey we're on is a journey that we should be taking. But it's okay. You see, the trip from, from, from the Red Sea to the promised land was only a two-week journey. But it took Israel 40 years. This delay does not mean denial. It means that God is doing something with you to get your attention so that he can send you and tell you to go, to take you from your woe to the go. So 40 days, 40 nights, Elijah is on a journey to Oreb, the mountain of God. Verse 9, he entered a cave there and spent the night. Let's continue to read and make some observations. Suddenly, the word of the Lord. Uh-oh. Who's speaking now? Who's speaking now? Yeah, God's speaking now. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Wait a minute, another question. Another question. I'm running from Jezebel. I've walked... For 40, that's right. <laughs> I like that. We're going to say that again. I'm going to give you the cue and I want you to say it just like you just said it because that's cool. That's the bomb diggity right there. I'm walking for 40 days and 49. I'm in this mountain now. And you're going to ask me, what am I doing here? Don't you know why I'm here? But why was he here? He was what? He was scared. <laughs> Listen to his answer in verse 10. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and I am, I am alone and left. I alone am left. And they are looking for me to take my life. Interesting God's response. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountain and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Ah. Huh. Huh. You were not in the noise and in the heat. Those things didn't have the power of your presence, even though they were obviously things you created. Isaiah found that even in the midst of worship and all the noise, that wasn't what changed him, it was your voice. You told me to go back out on the outside of the mountain and stand at the entrance there. And I've seen wind go by, you weren't in it. I've seen an earthquake occur, you weren't in that. And I've seen fire, 
heat, the power to give warmth or illumination, and you weren't in that. Well, where are you? I've been walking for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm afraid. You ask me why am I here? I'm telling you I'm here because I feel like I'm the only one left. And there's nobody in Israel that's serving you. And that if this woman catches me, she'll kill me. And then your word, God, will be stopped in Israel. Go back to verse 12. The latter part of verse 12. And after the fire, the fire there was a voice, a soft whisper. Now, tell me if you can hear what I'm about to say. Joe, come here. Joe, come here. Joe, come here. Joe, clap your hands. 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 I was saying that four or five times, but you guys didn't hear me. You know why? Because you weren't close enough. You were involved with the noise. You weren't close enough. God waits until we are still. He waits till we sit down before his feet until we become like Mary and we're not so busy working, preparing another sermon, preparing another song, going out to the street doing this, going to Africa, all of that stuff. He waits until you stop. And you listen, and you can hear him say, clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. In that still, small voice, here is what he says to Elijah. Suddenly a voice came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Wait! Didn't you just ask him that? Didn't he just ask him that? Let's see if Elijah has learned anything. Look at verse 14. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, he replied. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they're looking for me to take my life. Wait a minute. Didn't we just read that in verse 10? Didn't we just read that in verse 10? So you're telling me that 14 and 10 are the same answer? It's the same answer to the same question? Has Elijah learned anything yet? The difference, though, is that he heard that still, small voice. And he was honest with God about what he at least thought was his reality. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Confess your faults to him. Give them to God, even if they're wrong. And we're going to find out in a moment that Elijah was wrong. He was wrong. He had it all wrong. But look at God's response. Verse 15. Then the Lord said to him what? Say that a little louder. 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 So you're telling me that after his woe, his fear and confusion, God sent him on a 40-day journey and 40 nights. 
put them in a cave, let a whole lot of loud stuff go on around him to get his attention, and then was able to whisper to him. And although God asked him the same question and he gave God the same answer, he was at least being honest, but he heard God's voice and that was enough for God. That is enough for God for you. It is enough that you hear his voice and then he will tell you to go. If we read the rest of the text, you'll learn that not only was he not the only one left, but God said there's 7,000 more over here that have not bowed to Baal. Who told you that you were the only one left? Who told you that you were the only one left? Who told you that I would have just one man and if that man died, my word would end? Who told you that? Let me tell you who told you that. The devil told you that. Your fear told you that. Your misconfusion told you that. Misconfusion, that's not even a word. You know, your confusion told you that. So let me apply this and ask you a question. Who's telling you the things that have, you've been wrapped around in your brain that keep you from going? Who told you you couldn't go? Who told you you're not good enough? Who told you that your sin will separate you from God? Who told you that? God did not tell you that. I'm, just turn me down because you know me. <laughs> Who told you that? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you this was your lot in life? Who told you that no men can be trusted, which is why your marriage is so full of hell? Who told you that, um, that your wife's not good enough, which is why you're lustful and all sorts of stuff? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you can't communicate with your children? If you listen to God, he might tell you that they were molested when they were 11 years old, and that's what's really going on behind the scenes, but you don't listen. Church leaders, who told you how to run a church? You think you know? Have you been quiet enough in God to let him speak to you? Or are you just good about organizing? Worship leaders, who told you you know the way to do it? And, oh, I'm speaking to myself too. Who told you you know how to do it? Who told you you didn't know how to do it? Who told you who the next leader's going to be? Who told you that? Who told you that people won't listen to you if you preach the gospel on the street? Who told you that if you live holy at college that you wouldn't be accepted and that would be a bad thing for you? Who told you that God would reject you? Who told you that? Ah, that's been the flesh. That's been our fears. That's been the things that are going on inside of us from the time we were knee high to a duck. We've got, the psychological industry calls them constructs, okay? The Bible calls them strongholds. They are beliefs, things that you have believed for a long time, that you have allowed the enemy of your soul to build a garrison around your vulnerability. We call that strongholds and fortresses. But I know a God who knows how to break down fortresses and break them down and knock down. He will knock down walls. He will break every garrison that comes up. Turn me down, please, because I'm going to scream this. He knows how to break down every stronghold in your life, in my life. Nothing can withstand against the knowledge of God. Nothing. But are you sitting quietly? Or are you just working, Larry? Go through a lot. You know, preachers know, and I'm not going to ask Lee or Ernie, who shall remain nameless, to, to, um, to admit to this, but I know it's true. You have no idea the pressure we go through the week or so before we have to preach. Oh my God, it's like, and guys, I've thought about that. That ain't nothing but flesh. That's us trying to be, we don't wanna be embarrassed. We wanna, we wanna make sure we do well. 
But I'm telling you, it's the flesh. I know it looks good. It's, it's okay. You know, we just want to do best for God. Yeah. No, we don't want to be embarrassed. And so we put a lot of time in study. But very little time by comparison sitting before the face of God. So you know what I did this time around? I spent more time on my knees before God. I did some studying, a lot of studying. I did my research, but I spent more time before God. Now let me ask you, did I hear from God? Is this message for you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he said, tell my people that they can come to church every Sunday and still not know me. They can worship me all they want and still not know me. Still go home and have the struggles of having been, been abused and all that stuff. Here's what God says in Psalm 46 and 10. In the King James Version, it says, be still and know that I am God. What I like about the uh, HCSB is that um, it kind of gives it to us straight. It actually interprets the Hebrew term, be still. And what does he say? Stop your fighting. By today's vernacular, chill. Well, that might even be old. Well, how do you say it now? Chill? I say chill. What do you say now? Stop tripping. Nice. Stop tripping. Stop tripping. Here's why. The context there has to do with battles going on. If you read all of Psalm 46, you'll find there's a lot of battles going on. But at the end of it, the psalmist reminds the people, stop tripping. I got this. Look at the rest of the text. And know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. Stop tripping. It ain't about you. It's never been about you. It's always been about me. And if you sit at my feet, you're going to hear me speak to you. You're going to hear me say, clap your hands. Lift your hands. You're going to hear me say things like, 